morning. Happy Saturday. I trust you guys are doing well. I know I just interrupted a great song, whatever song that was. I think Katie Shea has been playing it. Good morning, Katie Shea, all the way up in the Windy City. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So good to see you. I trust that the Windy City is treating you well and uh, keeping you safe and, and, and cool. Um, happy to see that a lot of people have been able to join us from around the world. Want to take a look and see who's here. What's up, Sama? We haven't chatted yet, but we definitely need to. Um, great to see that Michelle's listening in at work. So thank you so much. We've got friends from all around the world. Happy to see that uh, we've got friends all the way up in Edmonton. What's up, Brian? So we have Don Rossum in the house, along with Emma. And of course, Isabella and Vince, my dear friends. Good to see them, some good rich family. It's good to see Monica Guerrero all the way in Costa Rica and Nima Bo all the way in Africa. It's good to have Vanessa and Wayne. It's good to have Kev. What's up, Jim Jan? What's Jan? Hey, Jan. You're all laughing at me. It's good to see everybody here. And for those who are watching the replay, we're grateful that you joined us. So I know that uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time doesn't always work for everybody around the world at the same time. So Katie, when you and I chatted, we know that with rich ladies, this is a conversation um, with a man, which would be me, and a lady, which would be you. That's how we both identify ourselves right now uh, at this particular time. But we wanted to make sure that rich ladies was a distinction that people really understood was an expression and an experience of being a woman. And, and being a rich lady was feeling richer and the things that mattered most to her. And so we've had these conversations now probably over a year long, and we've come to learn a lot about what women really are challenged by, what ladies are pressed against, and what uphill battles they are actually in fact fighting, you are in fact fighting. And we come together once a month to just chat about one of them. And, and the one that we've been talking about recently that we're gonna end up touching on again in a deeper and impactful way is this conversation around self-worth. Now, self-worth is an interesting conversation and it's quite complex because self-worth, when observed in the realm of men or amongst guys, um, there's machoism, there's confidence, there's a different gravitas towards it. Um, and even though men, and I do speak on behalf of most of them, not all of them, because I don't account for all of them, uh, they definitely have a mind of their own. They, they, they operate with a very different sense of freedom, but self-worth is a very, very different conversation. Katie, tell me, in the coaching sessions that you lead in all the work that you do with women around the world, um, helping people build their MLM businesses and helping people, in fact, get through and break through some of their own barriers and self-limiting beliefs, which we know are governed by the three keepers, something that we know is... Um, what is self-worth as a conversation? What, what does that mean right now for women today, you think? Yeah, so it's self-worth, meaning, you know, your overall opinion of yourself, judging yourself, like, how, how is my worth in myself, right? Um, <clears throat> and this is a conversation which I think is so interesting to me because for me, like, I'll give you, like, an example of myself. Like, you know, I could give you some examples of just coaching in general, but, like, myself, um, I thought I had, like, my self-worth in check right? Especially through coaching and everything that we've been doing. Um, but I've come to realize like throughout my growth, even this past year, it creeps up still, right? Like I'm in rooms with people that are, you know, bigger than me and I get pulled back and I become like this, like silent person, which is so weird because I'm very confident in other ways. Right. And so it's very, it's a very interesting topic because there's things that get us pulled back and you don't even realize it comes up. No, it's true. And, and what we don't realize, and if you're making any notes right now, um, you might want to write this down, is self-worth is grounded in a self-limiting belief system. It, it, it is the mental construct from which you live and lead life from. Now, I know a lot of people who are here are, are largely ladies, but there are some, some men as well. And I mean, it, it accounts for us as well, right? Vince and, and Mark and uh, Jim and, and Dawn. I mean, when you really think about what you are talking about is the self-belief system is much like a thermometer. And we've heard friends of ours talk like this. My dear friend, uh, T. Harv Eckert would talk like this. 
your 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 thermometer, if it were. Um, my beloved old friend, uh, God rest his soul, Bob Proctor, um, would talk about this. Uh, limiting beliefs were like setting a barometer. But when it comes to understanding your mental and 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 internal view of what you're worth, it actually comes down to the standards you set for yourself. And it's grounded in, in, in very, very uh, earth-shattering research that was conducted in the 50s that is rooted in cyber cybernetics. And when you look at cybernetics, you realize it is like all around the RAS, the reticular activating system. And it's the what you focus on comes through. It's the what you focus on becomes what's so. And oftentimes what people first start with is an unhealthy view on what their value is right out the gate. So as soon as someone has a very low self, what we would see and experience a low self-esteem, a sense of low standards, or a sense of low self-worth, then when they head out into the world, whether it's in relationships, whether it's even interactions with their children, or at a place of work, all they're looking for is affirmation and confirmation that that standard is true. And that's a horrible way to start a day. And that's a horrible way to lead in life. And that's a horrible way to lead in life and experience life. So everything's just confirmation for the view that you have. So if you're writing down any notes, especially if you're a coach, a mentor, a trainer, you got to know this, is that the belief you start your day with, the world will prove you right for. And that's why it's so important. You know, Grant Cardone, my dear friend, he would always say, you know, start your day by writing your goals. You know, Robin Sharma, my other dear friend, he would always say, write your top five things you're most grateful for before you start your day, if you're a part of the 5 a.m. club. And the list goes on. But regardless of what approach you have to starting your day, do you notice the consistent truth of what they all are suggesting? Is starting your day with the view of what you value most first. That's why they say don't write down the things to do. Don't write down the stuff that haunts you. Don't, don't be starting your day with the things that you regret or resent having to get to first. Because then all you're looking for for the rest of the day is resentment. All you're looking for for the rest of the day is the other things to resist. Who here has noticed that we've had more days than we'd like to admit where you resist most of the day? Resist the things that are happening, the things that you're thinking, and the things you have to do. And, I, and my hand's up too, by the way. Because what ends up happening is I'm, I'm a doer. So I'll, I'll start my day with the things I have to do. But the way we start our day is a reflection of and how we view our worth is the standard we live. So that standard's got to get cleaned up. What's up, David Starline? Good to see you, Keith. So Katie, is this making sense to you? <clears throat> it is, yeah. I mean, when I, when I bring it back to like myself and the people that I coach, like when I think of like a certain situation, I'll give you a little bit of a story. So like this kind of pulls together, right? Um, so this was not even like a couple, this was like a couple months ago. I, I went on a trip with one of my mentors and he has a lot of friends that are celebrities. He's like, Katie, I want you part of what we're doing. Come on board, come to Scottsdale with us. I said, okay, fine. Sounds great. I got it. So I went over there and, um, you know, it was so funny because we were sitting there with these big people and we were in these rooms and he looked at me across the table. He said, you know, you deserve to be here, right? Without even me and saying anything. So like right there in that moment, I sat back and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this guy can read like how you said, like the belief, like I went into that room with that belief system that I didn't deserve to be there. And so it was, it was portrayed that way. And um, so this resonates with me a lot because, you know, starting my day with what I value most and starting my day with, you know, being grateful for myself and, you know, what abilities that I have that could bring to the world and things like that, that really shifts the way that you view yourself and then others view you. No, I like that. I like, I like how you're, how you're thinking. Yeah. And, and, here's, and here's what's interesting. That, that brings up one of the first of the three distinctions that really creates and causes a very new shift in your relationship to self-worth. And that comes up with self-approval. 
So self-approval is a, a byproduct and a function for shifting your relationship to self-worth. It just is. But you've got to first understand that the big part of what actually gives you self-approval is grounded inside of three very interesting places. It's the ones who govern you, others, and yourself. Let me explain. Do you ever operate in your day and you wonder to yourself, I wonder what my mother would say or would my dad approve? Or would my aunt agree? Someone you looked up to growing up, someone who is your idol, someone that you emulated much of who makes up who you are, that person in your mind governs much of your mental fitness around going left or going right. Like, who's yours, Katie? Who did you look up to? I think it was your mom. Yeah, <clears throat> it was definitely my mom. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said, I mean, that's, that's, a, there's a point of reference. Everyone just write down point of reference. So when you have a point of reference, the first thing is, this is why, for example, when it comes to investing, it's hard for some people to invest because their point of reference might be a mother, a grandmother, a, a grandfather, a, a father, or a brother or an aunt, someone who's very risk adverse. And so what ends up happening is they can't write that check because the first mental check-in is actually saying, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Who can agree with that? Just give me a thumbs up if you all get what I'm trying to say here. So there are governing principles, people that you looked up to that are there. And then there's others, your peers. You know, what would your friends say? What would family say? And although parts of us would say, I don't care what they say, Women are far more inclined to care what others think than men. And the reason why, and I say this as a, on behalf of other men, is we're just not emotionally built to understand what the consequences of thinking about others really is. We can't think past two, three more people. Sorry, guys, just saying how it is. <laughs> but women, ladies, have an, have an innate ability to really think of the repercussions relationally, given a choice. But then, of course, that comes down to self. So this is all around approval. Is this resonating with you, Katie? Yeah, definitely. It definitely cool. is. Now, I've got uh, a really special a special guest here, a real dear friend of the, the rich universe uh, that's joining us. Uh, it's great to see her, uh, Samantha Joy. She's, she's an author. She's a speaker. She's a podcast leader and a host. Uh, probably most importantly, though, she's a mom. And uh, in getting to know her, I'm really... Uh, truly blown away by the gravity that she brings into the world as she leads women courageously through great conversations, navigating themselves and their own stories around reclaiming and restoring their relationship to their power and their possibilities. So uh, Samantha, so good to have you here. How are you this morning? I am so great. What an amazing way to start a Saturday. I'm just so impressed with everyone showing up on this weekend and I'm in mountain time, so I'm eight o'clock, which may not sound super early to you guys, but I, yes, I do have a little toddler and just making the time and prioritizing really pays dividends. So I'm just so happy to be here. And thank you for that introduction. I was not expecting that. Thank you so much. No, it's cool. It's like what Roy Rogers once said, when you toot someone else's horn, it sounds twice as loud. So you're welcome <laughs> and it's much deserved and uh, quite fitting given you're on the mountainside time. So that's a good quote for the day. But, uh, but Samantha, given, given all the work that you've been doing over, over the years, um, why don't you maybe just tell folks a little bit about the kind of um, experience you've had in working with other fellow ladies when it comes to having discussions about their relationship to self-worth? What's your view on the whole conversation? Well, so my response to that immediately goes to the root of where I discovered a lot of my beliefs and then where it came into my reality. And I found myself in an executive position in the corporate world. Um, I left that position about four years ago, but that all came to a head when I was there because I really started to understand that I was this kind of yes woman climbing the ladder. And it's it's so interesting, Rich, you go into this point of reference and these governing principles, like this is all about my dad and just pleasing my dad and making him happy and just getting to the level that really exhibited to him that I was successful. It was like his definition of success. And then I, the short story is I saw a hypnotherapist and I was like, cause I don't feel fulfilled. Like what's happening. And it all started to unravel. And then, um, I had been running a coaching business on the side of this position. And so I was in these, like this conflicted place and I didn't consciously know it, but I'm like, 
pouring my soul into this coaching business and these clients and then having to like button it all back up to just go to work. And I finally, it all came to a head and I took the risk and I wrote a book and all of that. And through that process, I, and, and through mentorship, I really realized this all comes down to identity. So Rich, you are speaking my language because really dissecting and learning in my own experience so that I can impart this on clients around how identity is formed and how it's reinforced. And through that knowledge, it helped me to understand why I kept saying no to myself unconsciously. I didn't even know I was doing it, but why I kept saying no because of the way I viewed myself. And to wrap that up, it's really just identity and learning the role that it plays in our lives. It affects everything we see, feel, say, do, things we don't want to hear, right? The, the way we curate our life to fit in that box with that kind of cognitive dissonance that we form. Um, it helped me to break that mold and really remove layers of conditioning so I could take risks and step into my myself, my true self. So it's been a journey and it's been incredible to help people in the well, people who are coaches, people who are in just personal development, like all of you here, just trying to better yourself, it's helped me to help them understand that you're not a failure. Shame is keeping you from a lot of your own progress and reaching that highest self. So kind of navigating that in a way of, you know, if you're not adopting a new mindset, it's not because you suck. It's not because you're a failure. It's not because you're broken really like dissecting how the mind works so you can start making better decisions and viewing yourself in a higher identity. So that's my spiel, but. No, I love your spiel. I love it. And I mean, everyone that's watching this right now, I mean, this is what it's all about is this is one great conversation. What creates community is courageous conversations. If you want to write that down, I really believe that. That's why this is uh, happening on a Saturday morning. This is why we're all doing it while, while Don's riding the bike. You know, while uh, Emma's doing global domination plans for the week ahead and why Marie Wagner's, you know, doing what she does, all the best that she does all the way up there in Alberta. I mean, the list goes on. But what's amazing is that um, for me and Katie and those who've been following the rich, sort of the rich universe, um, I'm, I'm from a very interesting, eclectic group of research and, and study. And what Samantha just said was spot on is that everything that we are and everything that we experienced is caused and created. I want you to write that down. Now, for some of you, it might sound like, oh my God, Rich is gonna talk about this again. For some of you, you've been in this for over a year with my mastery program, but for some of you, it might just actually really be new, it might be fresh. But, but, but if everything's caused and created, like just think about today, right? Everything you're gonna to do today is caused and created. There's things you wanna do, there's things you must get to, there's things that you're asked to get done, that's being caused, that's being created. So far, so good. Give me a thumbs up unless you're driving. Right. So to Samantha's point, which is a real great continuance to what Katie had said, and, and we're going to open up the lines here to take some of your questions, if you like, because um, we think we did, we really enjoy hearing some of your voices to hear how this is really striking the chord. And by the end of today's conversation, we're going to give you three more tools that you can really use starting today so that you can start realizing you can shift your relationship to where self-worth gets to be restored and recreated. We're going to get restored and recreated. But back to the point. So if futures are cause and created, what's in the future? What's in the future? Well, things you do, right? People to be with, things to go after. But what does the future have in common with right now? Starts with a Y, ends with an O. Anybody? Anybody? You. <clears throat> so if the future can be caused and created as in a thing and a place and stuff to do, so can you. So your identity, to Samantha's point, is something that we've evolved into and have adopted much of. We've evolved into it, but we've adopted much of because it's all past-based. Everything that you are, everything that you have is all past-based. But what can be caused and created is a future self as in a future you. And I'm not trying to put words in Samantha's boy, uh, voice, by the way, I'm just saying it my way, um, which might be seeing a lot of the same stuff. But for that to be said, you've got to know that it starts with giving yourself new self-approval, not worrying about what they would say, not worrying about what all those folks would say, and not worrying about what anyone else would have to say, but knowing that what you say matters. That comes down to approval. The second one is permission. 
and, and, and Samantha hit that on the head. When it comes to giving yourself permission to do things, whether it's going after it, whether it's starting a licensing program, whether it's working with Grant Cardone or John Maxwell or for that matter, um, you've got to know that it comes down to really appreciating your position and place. Because this is something else that's part of our heritage. Who here remembers growing up that you were taught or told that you should stand there? Don't speak until, you know, do this, don't do that. Like you were taught sort of like the decorum of existence. You all with me? Mm-hmm. Like growing up when I was a kid, remember my father was a military man, you know, you know, children do not speak and are not heard in the house, which is amazing because I'm the most rambunctious guy I know. <laughs> but I always paid for it. Hey, by the way, David, I don't know if you know this, but your camera, it might have a little bit of a smudging on the screen there. We can't see your pretty face. So just wipe it down there with something, if you don't mind, because you look blurry. You look like you're coming out of a fog. And uh, I want everyone to see how good looking you are. So with that being said, I mean, the reality is that understanding your position and understanding your place is something that we've adopted. And when you think about a place or you think about a position, what comes with it also is a predisposition of experience. It's kind of like being a defense person in a sport where you don't get to make plays that puts in the goal. It's just assumed that you're the one who's going to run sort of like defense. So you don't experience the game the way score makers do. Does that make sense? That's probably a very abrupt metaphor. But in other words, the position and your place on that field is determined and defined by the position you play. With women, there's a predisposition of experience that there's a certain level of experiences that you should have. You should have. But no one ever talks about the experiences you can have. Kate, are we tracking right here? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Especially with the permission and how you said, like, a lot a lot of us, I mean, I'm not a mom yet, right? But a lot of us, like, you know, you, you should be a mom, you should stay at home, you should do this. And even like my own family, like, um, you know, my grandparents are like, well, you're going to stay home when you have, you know, when you have a kid, I'm like, I, I'm still going to be working. No, like, I, I want to do what I love to do. Because a lot of us, you know, we, you don't give ourselves that. I mean, like how Samantha says, it goes back to our identity, right, of like who we are. And if we have a big enough vision, and it's something pulling us forward into who we want to be, we could become that person. It's just giving ourselves that permission to become that person and not letting anybody else deteriorate you to go towards that. So, well, yeah. And, that, and the great continuation of what you're saying, and um, if you've got any questions, by all means, put your hand up. We'd love to hear your voice and we'll address it with Samantha and Katie Shea here joining us live for Rich Ladies, is, is, is women have got to be willing to, here it comes, break the mold. Now you've got to be willing to break the mold. You know, I've often shared, and this may not be a very ladylike expression, but I remember when I became very successful very early in life, I was very ashamed of it, and I would hide it. I would hide it from my father, who said that, you know, money was hard to make, and it was, uh, it was tough to get. And so whether I had a fancy watch on or I had my own car, I wouldn't park the car near his house when I would visit him. I would take off my watch, literally, and put it in my pocket so he wouldn't see that watch on my hand. And so I would pretend to be something I really wasn't, but only to appease his view of the way the world must look given his worldview. So I'm gonna give you an advanced coaching insight. Everyone's operating from their worldview, everyone. We all have our own worldview. And you all notice before I go up to Danielle Tucci is that our worldviews are evolving, but we are the last escape for it. Who here has young children? Like I've got a 15 year old. They see life differently than we do. And we saw life differently than our parents did. So can you imagine another generation from now, the hindrances that they'll have that we had that they'll never experience? Because I bet you any money that the collective here, whether you're an aunt or an uncle, a mom or dad, right? Or just a close friend of a young family, you likely don't thwart upon them a restricted view of the world, the way it should be. Everyone can do anything. Does that make sense, double okay? Get my point? 
So we're, we're still going through a little bit of really, quite frankly, an emotional and intellectual reframe. We are still going through it. There's still a bit of a human awakening, so to speak. And it's spiritual, it's intellectual, it's definitely emotional, but it's, it's, it's real. It's here, it's now. And that's why I think social movements are so great, so strong and so loud currently as well. So uh, let's hear what Danielle Tucci's got to ask. Come on in, girl. Good morning. I love this. So my family, I have a disability and it was caused at birth. A hospital cut off my circulation, right? So I had over 100 IVs in me and it was always on my mom's side. You can't do this because you have cerebral palsy. You can't play softball in college. You're going to get hurt. Um, and they kind of geared me towards, well, that fear that I had low self-esteem and I noticed it. And then they would tell me about it. Well, you have low self-esteem, you have low self-worth. And there were things else that were caused, which again, I felt a certain way and that led to different things and that happened. And now looking back on it and saying, no, this is what I feel. This is how I feel. And trying to tell family members where they don't resonate, right? So as you were saying, they see the world differently. They disagree with me telling them how I feel. Again, it's it comes down to you give yourself permission, as you were saying. I feel this way, but they don't want to accept it because they have old school beliefs or they believe this way. How do you deliver it in a better manner to make your prove your point? Well, here's the thing. Uh, you And you hit the nail right on the head. There is no reason to live a life looking for others' acceptance. None. It's your life. It's your life. It's your own unique set of circumstances and gifts and hindrances and shortcomings. You are a working miracle. All of you are. I mean, each and every one of you have got a story that can definitely be told and then taught and likely storified by way of a movie or film treatment. I mean it. There's probably some really great dramatic points in there. Probably X-rated too. <laughs> but all kidding aside, just kidding, Saturday morning, sorry. But I mean, all kidding aside, the reality is that you cannot look for other people's acceptance because that's you playing and living life according to that which you've sacrificed and forfeited the control and the power and i would write that word down everybody the word power i use that word i wrote it down on my on my notes and i thought i don't want to drop that word because it's always it always comes across as very masculine power but all human beings have power and when you surrender your power when you forfeit your power you're now the dog that gets wagged by the tail and that's why you get dizzy and that's why it gets busy. And that's why it gets frantic. And that's why it gets tough. And that's why you feel like you're at the effect of things. And that's why you feel like you're always hurrying up, catching up, trying to trying to keep up. Does that experience make sense to you, Danielle? Just give me a, th a thumbs up. Katie, you with me? Mm, yeah. Samantha, what do you have to say about that? Tell me, girl. I first, I, I have to share this. I found this yesterday. Please. And I, I don't believe anything just happens by mistake. I think you found me. But Danielle, that is so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for being an inspiration to step out of that box and step out of that conditioning. Because I do believe, like Rich said, there's like a collective shift and awakening happening. And so this quote found me yesterday. And I just have to read it to everyone. Too many people spend their lives being dutiful descendants instead of good ancestors. The responsibility of each generation is not to please their predecessors. It's to improve things for their offspring or just future generations to come. It's more important to make your children proud or future generations than your parents proud. It, that like, whew, that hit me. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And Danielle, thank you again so much. So powerful. No, you're spot on. I'm glad you shared that quote. I mean, I've often said that before Katie you and I keep echoing this before I get up to our dear friend Jan Hurwitz but you are creating and causing the standard in which becomes your heritage that's your legacy I've often said that the way legacy is defined isn't by what you leave by what you leave is defined by how you live how you love and how you lead so when you think about how you lead how you love and how you live those things designed 
actually, in fact, define what you leave. That's your legacy. It's not about stuff. It's not like, you know, here's all the stuff that your dad left, or here's all the stuff that your aunt left. It's not stuff. What really is inspiring is, is, is the tribute, is the uh, approach, is the characteristics, is the way of living and the way of being in this life. That's the real legacy that someone leaves behind. And so to Samantha's point, you're, you're all responsible for the rewiring and rewriting, the rewiring and the rewriting of, of how your, your heritage lives on, moves on, and goes up. All right, Jen, I'm coming to you. Um. Okay, thank you. And for this conversation, Richie and uh, Katie and Samantha, for that quote, that really spoke to me. Um, so I grew up in a house where uh, my mother's version of me having made it or any woman in our family was to go to college so I could find a doctor or a lawyer to get married to. And I remember the day she said that to me and I'm like, yeah, I don't think so instead of doing that, why don't I just be that? And that's always been a driving force in me. So my question to you, Richie, is around the phrase self-worth. Um, I recently discovered that my, and I like to call this my granddaddy lie, um, my self-limiting belief um, comes in a phrase that if I become rich or flat out wealthy, that I will be not only unhappy, but downright miserable, which to me is a complete threat to who I am. How does that relate to the self-worth phrase? I don't know. Let's, let Katie, did you want to take a crack at that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so what I would say, um, you know, the, the, you know, being almost like, like I feel bad for, for, you know, bringing in wealth to me, right? Like, like bring, like drawing in wealth to me, like makes me feel almost like guilty. Right. Cause like, that's like how your mom was like, you need to marry somebody that has that. You need to go and marry somebody that already has that. That's not you go marry that. And so that's the belief that was almost given to you. And so now when money comes your way, it's like, hold on, wait, wait, let me pull back a second. That's not me because that's a belief system there. Am I right, Richie? No, you're, you're right. I mean, if anyone's tracking this, I mean, Jan brings up a very interesting conversation. And what we're talking about is, is, is around the history of mankind and it's both its prosperity and its perseverance. When, when, I want you to write down these two words, bloodline and prosperity. You know, when, when marriage was first invented, it was a means to, in fact, preserve the two. So bloodline, as in the preservation of royalty or power, Right. And then the second being prosperity. And so if, if, if a man were to be proposed to a woman, the two houses or the two homes, the two families would come together to see what would be the advantages for both to do that. It was never about love and it was never really about romance and it was never really about courtship. It was manufacturing the brightest and best way forward for those two houses to benefit optimally should these two marry. Does that make sense? Just give me an okay. So the preservation of a bloodline and the preservation of prosperity. So, you know, let's say if I were trying to court a young lady and David Starline was courting a young lady, but he had a lot of cattle, but I had a lot of land, I might luck out and get that young lady because the land would be then rented by those who would farm it. And I would end up getting great rents from that land and therefore securing the probability of my wife and my family to survive. So far, so good. It was business. It's all business. And so at the end of the day, of course, when you think back to maybe the 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, 70s may be included, but I, I don't think anyone was here young enough to remember the 60s and 70s. We have a very young bunch of people here. Um, all kidding aside, the point is that it was all about survivorship. The challenge in parents telling their kids, hey, you should marry a doctor or someone wealthy or someone with a lot of land is saying, hey, you're not capable of being successful. That's what they're really saying. You do not have what it takes to be successful and take care of yourself in your own way. So therefore, keep yourself uh, admirable. Keep yourself, uh, what's the word? Um, What's the word, Katie? Help me here. Um, desirable. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm watching the word so it's not wrong. Desirable. So that you can attract a suitor 
that will take care of you, that will provide for you and your children so you don't have to worry. And all of a sudden, you have this new optic out there called the kept woman. When it may not necessarily be so, it's just a part of this heritage that we've adopted over 300 years of history where a lot of women were, in fact, set up to be taken care of. But forfeiting romance and intimacy, love and connection, self-expression, and many, many others, which is a part of the identity conversation, which we will get into uh, much deeper in time with Samantha Joy, as she's a specialist when it comes to people helping to not only define and identify your identity, but to rewrite it and recreate it in a way that works for you um, and honors you, I would say, uh, if that makes sense, Samantha, yes? Okay, cool. Let me get up to, to, to Yasmin here. It's good to see Yasmin in the house. What's up, Yasmin? Thank you, everyone. A great conversation. Thank you very much. And by the way, shout out to Katie. She's the one, she's the reason I'm here today. So, <laughs> uh, you mentioned something that hit me really strong. You're not capable of doing this. You're not capable of speaking. You're not capable of being successful. This is what I heard and what I felt when I was a child. I was, you mentioned that we were not able to express ourselves in front of grown ups in the school, in the house. Uh, in the uh, training, uh, basketball, whatever it is. So as a result, as a result, I was having all of those conversations internally in my head because I knew that I was special. I knew that I have my goals and dreams and visions. So all of those conversations, instead of speaking them out loud, they were in my head. And this is how I, uh, I spent my childhood. Now, to break through this, it was very difficult and many people were, were amazed, like how this girl, she was nothing and she became something. But still I'm caught in, the, uh, in those fears. I'm still caught in those limitations. I'm still unable to express myself the way I want to be and the way I have the conversation in my head. I'm unable to express it loudly and I want to, like, I want to do it, but how, I don't know. Yeah, well, here, here's, here's the reality, and I'd love to hear what Samantha has to say, because I know that she just joined us for a short period of time um, because some commitments are, are pressing for her. So I want to make sure that as I have a 10 minute window with her, but Yasmin, here, here's what I'll say, and I'll, I'll share it with everyone else, is, is as a parent, I know, and I wonder if anyone else would agree, is what you don't want for your child is for them to suffer be in pain or do without, right? It, it pains us. It, it pains us. It pains us to think that our child could ever suffer, could ever really go hungry, uh, could ever be ridiculed or bullied, right? Um, I mean, just the other night, it was hard for heard my son say to me that just shocked me. I'm not, I, 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 I'm mortified to even repeat what he said, but he had an experience doing something and he got it dead wrong, like dead wrong. And he, and he said something where he's like, you know, I, I want to just, you know, jump off a building. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying it quite cutely. And I looked to him and I said, my son, please, you can be hurt, you can lose, but don't ever, ever say those words. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's heartbreaking. And you think to yourself, it can never be said around you. You're the kind of parent that's strong. You're the kind of parent that leads better. You're the kind of parent that provides a great environment. But, but children can take things wickedly out of context and make them mean many things. Yeah. Now, why I share that with my dear friend here, Yasmin, is, is that when it comes to all of us, we are governed by the three keepers. We subconscious mind structure where we have the keeper of judgment. We don't know what people are going to say. The keeper of ego. I don't want to look bad or the keeper of fear saying, I'm afraid of getting it wrong, not being right, being controlled or be controlled. Those keepers are far stronger for our parents and our parents' parents than they are for us. And our children have far fewer keepers because we give them the advantage of freedom to do as they wish without those keepers present. So my point from saying that to you is that being a living demonstration, Yasmin, you've got to write that down. Being a living demonstration 
for doing it the way you are destined to do it, not the way others are dictating for you to do it. I mean, that's, that's critically important for me to say. Samantha, do you have anything to weigh in on that before we lose you? Yeah, I, I think this is just a, such a powerful conversation because it resonates with almost all of us moving through generations, right? This is, this is the process. And I, I like to impart maybe just like a small little exercise and it may seem simple and you may have harder, a harder time in parts of it than other parts of it, but it, it all starts with awareness. That's why I love this environment here. And I'm going to bring it full circle to environment, kind of a leaving a little foreshadowing there, but awareness is where a lot of this starts. It started there for me of what are my limiting beliefs and moving into, well, what is the root of these and, and which of these are mine? Like, did I inherit these from past generations? And let me try to go to that root of, is this from my mother? Is it from my mother's mother? And without going down a whole rabbit hole, just really identifying what isn't mine, right? And then moving into, this is kind of the third step of moving into, well, what is evidence? So I want to go back to Jan too, as far as, you know, this conditioning, especially that women have of being in the box, right? And so what evidence can I now find that I don't have to live that way, that I can step out? Because there are, when we talk about the conversation of women, there are many powerful women in the world that have stepped out of that box and shown us what's possible. So looking there instead of what we can't do or why we can't do it and bringing that full circle in this fourth step of environment. So this is a huge part of my identity work is environment. It's, you know, having a new talk track in your mind about what's possible, but that is reinforced by what's around us and who's around us. And so this group just, again, brings that full circle because you're now having conversations around what is possible and, you know, what you can potentially step into and you're seeing it all around you and you're, you're absorbing all of it. So you're here doing it, whether you realize it or not already. No, I love it. I love it. That's why we're going to give them something to do as soon as they leave. So thank you so much for joining us, Samantha. I know that uh, your time is limited. Um, hey, let me go to uh, Costa Rica and hear what Monica Guerrero has got to say. Come on and weigh in on those conversations. We're talking about self-worth and your relationship to it as a, as a lady. Come on in, Monica. Hi, um, I love what Yasmin was saying. Um, I find with many of my women and clients, um, from birth pretty much, we are tied, our identities as women and um, our value as women are, is usually tied to men or, you know, what we do in our lives and our societal expectations, so to speak. Um, and I've talked to many women like myself, we are strong, powerful women who have chosen to, to go outside that box. Um, yet we're, you know, constantly being, you know, told by other people what we should be doing. Um, we are silenced in many ways um, from society, um, at work, um, with our own families, we aren't able to speak our minds um, without um, being ridiculed or criticized in many ways. So, so women uh, carry a lot of baggage and trauma be just because of that. And um, I find the women that have gone past it, um, including myself, I mean, we've just learned to love ourselves so much that none of this matters. And so that's what I try to do with my clients is to help them to realize that your self-worth is not tied to, you know, what your family tells you, what society tells you, what men are telling you, what your boss is telling you. Um, but it is really difficult for women because um, in many cases, women don't support each other. Um, and then they join in on the bullying and it's difficult for a lot of women that way. So um, I am really, I admire many women who are very strong, who can stand up against all of that. And um, I encourage many women, anytime I see any kind of bullying, I encourage people to turn it around and say, look, this person's very brave. They're standing up for something that's right. And, um, and for myself, I'm only learning to use my voice right now because for most of my life, I was silenced 
as well. So yes, I trip over my words. I don't speak perfectly. And that's because I too have been silenced. And so my clients, you know, come to me because they feel the same way. And, um, and they can see that I've pushed past it. And so, so can they. So. I have to say, though, I've, in, in all that you've shared, you are eloquent, heartfelt, and truly incredibly empowered to express yourself in such an authentic way that it's moving and touching. So I'm not quite sure what view you have on valuing how you speak or occur in the world my dear, but I have to say just as, as one listener here, um, with some qualified sense of training people in the art and magic of communication, you are powerful. And I think you should just own that, period. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, skip, go, get your 200. Um, it's, it's a monopoly analogy for a fellow real estate investor. So uh, I really want you to get that. Is that okay? Yep. <laughs> All right, good. Good, good, good. I'm happy to hear that. And you know, Katie, what's, what's amazing is when women, and men are no different, by the way, us, us guys mess it up all the time. When, when I post something, there's going to be someone that says, well, good for you, but for every good for you, there's going to be three or four or five that are haters. Yep. Look at you brag, look at you boast. And that's why I'm very mindful of what I post. And, and the list goes on for a lot of men. Men, men are y- largely crabs in a bucket we don't want to elevate each other because it's a competition right we're living in some sort of archaic time where uh, heaven forbid we we say wow good for you vincent well done david good for good don keep going you working out you know mark gene like good for you y'all get what i'm saying but it's not a men thing and it's not a female thing folks it's a human thing That's where the analogy of keeping up with the Joneses came from. The only way we know that we're keeping up is by keeping score, by looking around. And as you look around to see what people have, what they're doing, where they're going, how they're enjoying their life, that's what starts to gauge you according to where you're at. But what needs to happen for women, because this is a rich ladies conversation, is women need to collectively and globally say enough. This is the new standard of woman. This is what it means to be one. This is what it means to have the choices and options and the freedoms to choose as we wish. And this is how we want to spend our most precious resource, which is our soul and our human energy and our bandwidth to doing things that are great for us first and great for others. Does that make sense? That has to be created though. And I think that's an opportunity for women right now. But before I get to that conversation. Let me see what uh, Mark Jean's got to say. Come on in, Mark Jean, sex machine. Hey, good morning. Uh, I just first off wanted to say thank you for letting us men join in in this conversation. Um, and for all the ladies that shared, uh, thank you. It's, it's very insightful and helpful to me, and I'm sure a lot of the other guys, in how we can relate to women, our wives, and you know, moms or whoever, sisters. So that's all I had to say was just thank you for allowing us to join in on this conversation. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. And, and only on the, on the fact that he had come in and said all that, because he's such a, a nice guy, is coaches should think about this as well. As a coach, I often will work with in symphony with other women coaches. So as I, as I coach men, largely I coach men, but when a woman enters the conversation, I make the option available for her to speak with a female counterpart. And that way we can triangulate on the same conversation. The reason why is because there's just some things that she won't tell me. But there's some things she will tell me that I have no idea how to empathize with. Need not get into detail. <laughs> and there's just some things that I can't understand because I have no point of reference for it. So, so there is, and this is what I really believe when it comes to coaching, mentoring, training, is that there is no harm in collaborating with a counterpart. So if you're a female coach, having a, a, a male coach, that, that is kind of like your go-to specialist on all things male and vice versa. So that together you can actually have a holistic conversation with an entire home or an entire group. And it's, I think it's a very powerful place to be. It's a very, so to, to Mark's point, 
because it's hard no matter what we what we men learn on how to communicate right with and or understanding how to empower women we're still not you we're still we still cannot operate at a diabolical level at, at a biochemical level what it is to be a woman we just can't we can't pretend to no matter how much studying we do no matter how much research we conduct we're just not that smart enough we're just not going to be we barely can handle being a man let alone empathizing with them. so uh, what i'm saying is straight katie what do you think did you yeah. freeze? oh there you are yeah yeah you you froze a little bit i think i think I, I don't know if anybody else saw that but um yeah no i think um first of all it's like how i said in the chat it's it's equally as powerful to have all the men here right um because i think it's 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 awesome to have you guys part of a conversation to see on the other side of things, like how Richie was saying, like how we could really come together. You know, I think that's what makes really powerful women is having, you know, men rising them up too. So I think that's really freaking cool. Um, but number two is Danielle, Jan, Yasmin, and, you know, Monica, all of your, everything that you guys said was super powerful. Um, and I relate with every single one of you guys. Um, you know, when it comes to how Samantha said before she jumped out, um, you know, whose beliefs are those? I, that, that hit me like on, on the head because, um, you know, I told, I, I was talking to my mom like a couple weeks ago and she, I was like, mom, you know, that learning disability that I had, I don't think that that was real. I, I didn't have that. Like, it's fine. Like, I think that like, I, I really, you know, believe that because it was a label on me and that was my identity growing up. And she looked at me and she loves me dearly, right? This is, she just said this because she loves me. She goes, no, you still have that. And I, and in that moment, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to keep on pushing towards my vision and who, who I'm committed to being and move that way. I love her, but she didn't mean it in a negative way, but that was just how I grew up and her experience, you know, happened. So um, you know, I, I resonate with this conversation a lot because we see it in every area of our lives. Yeah, and that's a great segue to um, two last points I wanted to make. First and foremost, all of you should have a journal, a place, a book, somewhere that you write your thoughts. Very, very simple, but you should have a self-worth journal or a section in there for it, where whenever there's a thought, whenever there's an experience, whenever there's a perception, and it doesn't serve you, write it down so that it doesn't live over here. It now lives over there. And it could be the place in which your value is not summed up in. Because whatever experiences you have and whatever doesn't truly serve you isn't you. But without a place for it to go, it becomes you. So one of the things that I use as a corrective measure, especially with my son and many of my coaches, is that whenever there's a, a thought or a statement, and usually, by the way, they're recurring, we're not that creative to come up with new ones. They're usually a repetitive pattern. You will keep telling yourself the same story until you finally accept it to be true. But until you actually elect for it not to be true, you live as though it is. So journalizing these thoughts or statements and you put them outside of your mind, outside of your being, outside of your body, is an energetic, spiritual, physiological, existential and philosophical means of just getting it out just get it out there's a lot of really great spiritual leaders here you know people who get energy you know like marie there's people here who understands you know the philosophy of things and, and the phenomenologicalness of things um so that's what that's you've got to journalize in order to preserve and protect your self-worth you've got to make sure that if it's not worth it for you it lives outside of you so write that down, put it somewhere else. Don't talk about it, don't speak of it. If it still haunts you, then talk to someone and that's where a coach comes in. Coaches don't always have to be the one who needs to in fact lead. They don't have to always have the right answers. Coaches don't always have to know what comes next. The most powerful thing a great coach can do is just listen. That's what makes Monica a powerful coach right now. She's a place that people can go to safely and just have a conversation without judgment, without assessment, without it meaning something. And, and, and quite frankly, and, and, and this, this is her own admission, um, with empathetic ears. I hear you, I get you, but this isn't who you are. 
a coach doesn't always have to be the one who is a knight in shining armor. It could just simply be a friend, a friend that people always would yearn for and want. All right, as I promised, a little hack. And when it comes to self-worth, what is the number one thing that is of most value for all of us in the few minutes that we've got left? Now, many would argue health, and that's absolutely true. Without health, nothing else matters. Without health, we ain't got life. Well, let's just assume that we're all healthy, right? The most valuable thing that you've now got is time. How you spend it, how you treasure it, how you honor it. And yeah, Emma, that's true. Like integrity could be a function of how you actually honor your time, for sure. It's, it's a, definitely a byproduct. I wouldn't say that your integrity doesn't matter. But time is the one thing that we all have that we can't spend silly. You can't be stupid in how you allocate it. So why that's important, <clears throat> especially when it comes to self-worth, is the exercise I would leave with you is begin to look in your day where you can actually gain a 2x on your time. Meaning, if you would literally give yourself 10 or only 20 minutes for self-care a day, try to get it to 20 to 40 minutes. And if not in a day, do it in a week. Fine. Now, some of you are already conquerors of your calendar. <laughs> really good at, of course, allocating time for yourself. But if you're a coach, a mentor, or a trainer, this is a really great shift for people to have when it comes to reinventing their relationship to self-worth. The first most valuable component of self-worth is time. How you get it, how you gain it, how you use it, and for yourself. And so the more time you're able to put aside for yourself, for self-care, self-keep, or just for self-serving reasons, just to be alone or silent, that's on you. And that's a power you need to start exercising. What you do over time is you want to increase that number. Now, again, I'm coaching you to do this. But if you're a coach, a mentor, a trainer, you can be doing this to your client. And clients, including yourself, have not just 30 minutes a week, but then an hour and then two and then three and then four. Guess what experience they have when it comes to rewriting their view on self-worth. They're the author. They're in control. And when you have that shift, a little bit of a, an aha moment, maybe even an awakening, now all of a sudden they look for other places to, in fact, 2, 5, 10x in that domain. Maybe it's not just time. Maybe now it's energy. Maybe it's not just energy. Maybe now it's friendships. Maybe it's now networking. Maybe now it's business. And this goes back to a point Yasmin had made, right? Being able to incrementally grow and re recapture your own control over the very gifts that you've got, starting with time. Katie, what do you think of that exercise? It's a great way to part, but to go forward with. Yeah, no, I love that exercise. Actually, that's one thing that I did on myself. Um, and I don't know if you've talked about this before, Rich, but, but I've done that before. And I've taught you know, my clients to do that as well. And it really does shift the way that you view yourself and you almost like fall back in love with yourself, right? Which I think is, is needed. You fall back in love with who you really truly are. And so um, that's a great exercise. I know that we're coming up on time. I think that's a really powerful exercise that you just gave though, Rich, but thank you guys, everybody. I'm going to give it off right. to Rich to say the last words, but. No, listen, you. I mean, we, we all are living this thing called life. And although the book might have been written, there are many pages ahead yet to be authored. What's most powerful for you is to recognize that you hold the pen and you alone, mm -hmm. that your hand is the weight in which the page feels. And that every word, as it is impressioned upon that page, comes with the conviction that you deserve and only have the right to impress upon it. Go write the rest of your life and live it by design and not by default. And self-worth is something that you define, not defined for you. Is that clear? Katie Shea, thank you so much for assembling such a wonderful, great-looking group of people, uh, notwithstanding my dear friends, uh, Don, David, and Mark. Uh, maybe Vincent, but we're so grateful. Uh, Sama, we need to talk, me, you, and Katie. Um, Monica, Emma, good to see you. It's great to see you, Keith and Tara, Jan. Uh, folks, go be blessed, be safe, uh, but more importantly, be you, because no one else can. 
not as masterfully as you can. So until next time, Katie Shea, thank you so much for a great session on Rich Ladies. Be well, everybody. Bye, guys.